Hello and welcome to this new video. In this video, I'm going to finish chapter 4 with Taylor's formulas. There are three forms of Taylor's formula, but before stating them, let me just introduce some terminology. What do I mean by a function of class C1? A function f is of class C1 if it has a continuous derivative. And more generally, a function f is of class Cn if it has continuous derivatives up to order n, and including order n. And f is of class C infinity if it, have, if it has derivatives of all orders, and they are necessarily continuous, because a differentiable function is continuous. Now, we use sometimes the, the adjective smooth. Okay, now the concept of a smooth function is a little bit vague because it depends on the context. But usually it means that the function has enough derivatives to make the, the, the discussion uh, make sense. Okay, so for example, in differential geometry, a smooth function is usually C infinity. In complex variables, for example, when we talk about smooth paths, we mean paths of class C1, okay? And it should be clear from the context what do we mean by that, okay? So now, having said this, we can say that in general, Taylor's, Taylor's formulas, uh, uh, actually, they do the same thing. They provide an approximation of a smooth function by polynomials. Now, why there are, there are three formulas? Because there are three different assumptions about the function f. It's three different assumptions on smoothness. Okay? So we have Taylor Cauchy or Taylor with integral remainder. We have Taylor Lagrange. And we have Taylor Young. Okay? The, there, there is something common to all these. Uh, which is the approximation of a smooth function with polynomials. Now, the difference is in the form of the remainder. Okay? <clears throat> now, but before I state them, let me just also introduce another terminology, the big O and small O notation, okay? which is very, very, uh, just, which are very important, actually. So, <clears throat> given a function defined on an interval I of R, taking positive or non-negative values, and a, a point in i, or in plus infinity, and let f be another function. We write that f of x is a small o of g of x, as x tends to a, if the limit of the ratio is equal to zero. Or otherwise stated, f of x can be made less than epsilon g of x for, for every epsilon, provided x is sufficiently close to a. Okay, and... We have the big O notation, uh, which means, what do we mean by when, when you say that F is a big O of G? It means that the ratio of F over G is bounded by a certain constant in a neighborhood of A. Okay, so everything happens locally around A. A could be plus infinity. Okay, so now we, 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 we shall give examples, actually. Uh, and these notations are actually very important in computer science, as we shall see. So, for example, ln of 1 plus x is a big O of x. Why? Well, you probably know that ln of x, ln of 1 plus x, can be written as x minus x squared over 2 plus so on. If you don't know that, it's not a big deal. We shall prove it. It's easy. So, locally, uh, so, if, uh, so ln of 1 plus x uh, divided by x actually is 1 plus something, so it's bounded near 0, okay? You probably know that ln of 1 plus x over x tends to 1, right? So it means that the ratio is bounded locally near 0, so it's less than a constant times x. Actually, it's just less than x as we, for x positive. Sine x can be written as x plus big O of x cube. Why? Because we can write sine of x as x plus x cube over th uh, 6 
or sorry, x minus x cube over 6 plus so on. And so these higher terms are denoted by big O of x cube. So it's less than a constant times x cube. Okay, if you if you don't if it's the first time you encounter this formula, it's not a big deal because we can prove them easily by using Taylor's formulas or using just limits. Okay, and near infinity, ln of x is a small o of x. Why? Because ln of x over x tends to zero, as you know, and x tends to infinity. Okay, so in principle, these are known facts. And we shall encounter other examples, actually, in the exercises, okay? And now, in computer science, this, the big O notation especially is very important, okay? Because in computer science, we study algorithms for sol solving certain problems, okay? Like sorting an array of size n or solving an n by n linear system. And we need to estimate the number of operations in the algorithm when the input size n of the problem is large. So this is what we call an asymptotic analysis. Okay? <clears throat> and all, all uh, as estimates for the complexity of the algorithm. Okay? So when the input size of the problem is big, how many operations we need uh, in the worst case, of course. For example, the usual algorithm for multiplication of two n by n matrices, if you count the number of operations, it's not difficult to find exactly that they are 2n cubed minus n squared. Okay, just, uh, you can just count how many additions and how many multiplications do we have. And now this 2n cubed minus n squared is precisely big O of n cubed. It's of the order big O of n cubed because this term is negligible when n is large. Okay, now uh, there are better algorithms. This is the usual algorithm that you learn in linear algebra. But there is another algorithm called the Strassen algorithm, which requires much less operations, which require a big O of n to the power 2.8074. This is a really a significant advance, actually, because when n is large, okay, this is, this, this is a significant amount of time saving when you pass from a big O of n cube to big O of n to the power 2.8. Okay. Now, if you learn the selection sort for sorting an array, uh, this requires a big O of n squared operation in the worst case. But there are quicker or more efficient algorithms. For example, the merge sort algorithm or the quick sort algorithms also require a big O of n log n. There is a significant amount because actually n square over n log n tends to infinity. So there is really a significant advance. When n is big, the merge sort and the quick sort algorithms are much more efficient than the selection sort. Okay, so we, we, when we economize on time, uh, so there's we, we, we may see the difference, actually. And if you take a course on computer algorithms, actually, you may just do some experiments to see the difference. So maybe if this takes uh, one minute, then this would take, for example, one second for n when n is large. Okay, and this is very important. So the, the time complexity of the algorithm is something very important, especially these days, because we only deal with big data. The, we need to, to really know uh, how, much, how long does it take to solve a problem, okay? And for example, there are even worse problems. For, for example, certain algorithms uh, require what we call an exponential time. So it's a big O of 2 to the n, or a factorial time, like the algorithm for uh, solving the traveling salesman problem. So these are hard problems, actually. And the known algorithms uh, require a long time, so many operations that uh, for when n is, for example, of order 100, so this may require centuries of computations. Okay, try to compute 
uh, one a factorial of 100. Okay, this is really above the capacities of most computers. So this is really an issue in computer science, the time complexity. And there is also another complexity actually, which is important, which is the space complexity, which, which um, uh, computes or estimate uh, the space needed, the, the memory needed by the algorithm, which is another issue actually. But time complexity is a more important issue actually because some algorithm may take centuries to be done if we follow certain known algorithms, okay? Okay, anyway, so now let us go back to our Taylor's uh, approximations. So we have, I will, I will state them first without the proof and then I will prove them. So Taylor Cauchy or Taylor with integral remainder states what? So we have now a function of class C n plus 1, so it has n plus 1 continuous derivatives, and we have, if you consider two points x and a in the interval, then we can write f of x as a polynomial of order n in x plus a remainder. And the remainder has a formula. It's 1 over n factorial times this integral. Okay? So, the remainder is just the difference between. So this this is what we call the Taylor polynomial of order n. We it's we can you can denote it by T n of x or P n of x. Okay. So there's the the common thing between all Taylor's formula is that we can write the function f as a polynomial plus a remainder. Okay. So this is the first form or Taylor's question. Now Taylor Lagrange, we the assumptions on f are a little bit weaker. So instead of requiring a continuous n plus 1 derivative, we're just requiring the existence of the, the n plus 1 derivative. Okay? So here, the fn plus 1 should be continuous. Here, fn plus 1 should, should just exist. And then we have something similar. f of x is a Taylor polynomial, the same one, plus a remainder. But the remainder has a little bit slightly different Four. It's fn plus 1 at some point c divided by n plus 1 factorial for some c between a and x. Okay? So they are very close together, but the difference is that in the assumption and in the form of the remainder. Okay? And lastly, Taylor Young, uh, it's the weakest form actually because it, uh, the assumption is just f to have derivative up to order n, and we just require that fn plus 1 exists at a. Okay, so this is just differentiability of fn at a. So it's the weakest assumption actually possible. And then we obtain something similar. So f of x can be, can be written as a polynomial of order n, right, in x, plus a remainder. And I can write the remainder as x minus a to the n times a function tending to 0. So we, get, we may write, if you like, x minus a to the n times epsilon of x, where epsilon of x tends to zero, right? So, uh, and if you want to use the big, small o notation, you can write f of x as a polynomial plus a small o of x minus a to the n, okay? So these are the three forms. They really look alike. They just differ, differ by their assumptions on f and by the form of the remainder. Okay, so it depends what you want to do. Okay, now let us prove Taylor Cauchy. It's very easy because, so you just use induction. <clears throat> okay, for n equals zero, it's possible that you take n equals zero. It's not, it's not a problem because when n equals zero, this is just f of a. Okay, so it means that you are approximating uh, f of x by a constant plus a remainder, okay? So now, the remainder in this case is just 1 over 0 factorial, which is by convention 1, times the derivative of, so n equals 0, so this is just f prime, and this is just 1, because it's x minus t to the 0. So for n equals 0, the statement is correct, because this is just the fundamental theorem of calculus. Just saying that f of the integral of from a to x of f prime is just f of x minus f of a. Okay, 
So now, suppose that the formula holds for some n, and let us prove it for n plus 1, but provided that now f is of class cn plus 1. So it's very easy. I take the remainder and integrate it by parts. Okay, so just first to uh, make things clear, so just multiply by n factorial to just to simplify the notation and integrate this integral by parts. So we need to differentiate fn plus 1 to get fn plus 2, and we need to integrate x minus t to the n with respect to t, because here in this reasoning a and x are fixed. Now, an antiderivative of x minus t to the n is minus x minus t to the power n plus 1 over n plus 1. So when we integrate by parts, we get this. This is the antiderivative of x minus t to the n, fn plus 1, between, evaluated between a and x, minus minus, because there are two minuses here, the derivative of n, fn plus 1 is fn plus 2, and times the antiderivative itself. But there are two minus cancelled, okay? And that's it. Now, if I evaluate this term, when t equal x, this is 0, and when t equal a, this is x minus a. So, <clears throat> this is just x minus a to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 times fn plus 1 at a, and I don't touch this one. And now... I divide by n factorial. <clears throat> uh, so when I divide by n factorial, I get here n plus 1 times n factorial, so n plus 1 factorial. And here I get 1 over n plus 1 times n factorial, which is n plus 1 factorial. Okay? So this is the remainder. And that's it. So if I replace the remainder by this value in the formula, okay, so I just have to add... So this, is, so this term plus this term is the remainder. So I get that f of x is now a polynomial of order n plus 1, of degree n plus 1, plus this remainder. And this is just the formula for n plus 1. Right? So it's very easy. Okay. Now, consequence... We can also write Cauchy, Taylor Cauchy or uh, Taylor the integral remainder in this way. So just put instead of x, a plus h. Okay, so h is the difference between x and a. So instead of x minus a, I have h. And now this can be, so this is the Taylor polynomial now as a function of h, which is the difference, plus a remainder. And there is a formula for this is the integral formula for the remainder and I just replaced x by a plus h So this is the integral from a to x And this is x minus t. So sometimes you may see uh, Taylor Cauchy or Taylor in this way, but these are, co are completely equivalent actually, okay? Now What happens when h is small? Okay, this is where we usually uh, Use uh, the formula when h is small Okay, now, this is, so the fn plus 1 is actually continuous, right? So, in particular, it's bounded on, a, on any compact neighborhood of A. So, on a neighborhood A minus delta A plus delta, this is bounded by some, by some constant n, uh, m, let us say. And when you take absolute values, so the absolute value of the remainder is less than uh, the integral of the absolute value, but I put actually absolute value again around the integral because h may, may be negative, right? So h could be positive or negative. So this is why, so this means that this is the integral from a to a plus h if h is positive, and the integral from a plus h to a if h is negative, okay? And that's it. So now, if h is positive, I can get rid of the absolute value, and I get just a plus h minus t to the n, and I can integrate that. This is a plus h minus t to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 with a minus sign. So it's 0 at h plus h, and it's just h to the n plus 1 when t equal a, right? So we can evaluate this, and this gives me just absolute h to the power n plus 1. And this is actually, it's convenient to write this as a big O. Instead of writing a big O of modulus of H 
to the n plus 1, we just write big O of hn plus 1. So just to simplify the notation. But we really mean here big O of absolute value of h to the power n plus 1. So when h is small, the remainder is a big O of h n plus 1. Right? So now we can write Taylor's uh, Cauchy in this way. So f of a plus h is, when h is small, is a polynomial of order of degree n in h plus terms of order h n plus 1. Okay? So this is a very good approximation, actually. When h is small, okay, so even if we take when n equal 2 or 3, if n equal 2, this is just h cubed. So if h, let us say, is of order is 0 0.01, this would be 10 to the minus 6, actually. So it's very small. The error or the remainder is very small when h is small. Okay. And this is really fundamental in numerical analysis when you want to do error estimates. And we shall see some examples in the exercises. Okay. Now, second four, Taylor Lagrange, as we did. Sorry here, so I just replaced, uh, was an error here. Uh, it's just not Cn plus 1. It's Cn and uh, Fn plus 1 exists. Okay? Just an error. And the remainder is now of the form Fn plus 1 Fc divided by n plus 1 factorial. Okay, this is slightly more complicated to prove. So we introduced a new function, an auxiliary function, capital F of t, uh, given by f of x minus the Taylor's polynomial, but not evaluated at x, at t, at a, it evaluated at any t. So you may take a variable here if you like. So, so for any t varies between a and x, or between x and a, same thing. When t equal a, we just exactly get Taylor's polynomial at A, okay? So f of A is just the remainder, okay? And my target is to prove that the remainder, or just f of A, is precisely of this form, okay? Now, also observe that when you put t equal x, this is zero because this is f of x minus f of x, and then x minus x, x minus x, s minus x. So f of x is also zero. We shall use this later. Now, we have a simplification here. If we take the kth term here, so, and differentiate it, this is a product, actually, as a function of t. When we differentiate this product, we get what? The k factorial doesn't change, so we differentiate fk one time, and we don't change that, plus the derivative of x minus t to the k with respect to t times fkt. Now, when we differentiate x minus t to the k, we get k x minus t k minus 1 times minus 1. Okay, so the k divided by k factorial will become k minus 1 factorial. Okay, now we just do... Uh, we differentiate, so this one, you differentiate with respect to t, this is just zero. I get minus f prime, and here I get two terms, and here I get two terms, and so on. If you write these just one above the other, you will see that we get simplification, because uh, this term cancel with the one before, this minus cancel with the one before. For example, here we get minus f prime of t, and when you differentiate with respect, there is a term which is f prime of t, so we get the cancellation between f prime and f prime. And the f double prime will cancel with this f double prime, and so on. So if you do the, do you write them properly, one above the other, you will convince yourself that when I differentiate all this sum, I just, I just get one term, which is minus fn plus 1 of t divided by n factorial x minus t to the n. Okay, if you don't believe me, just do the computations. Okay, so write this term, differentiate it, then this term, differentiate it, then this term, differentiate it, and so on. And cancel, do the cancellation, and just get one term, actually, which is the last one. Okay. Now, finally, we introduce another 
uh, auxiliary function, which is that I call g of t, which is f of t minus x minus t over x minus a to the n plus 1 times f of a. Okay, this is the last uh, change of variables that I do. And now what happens? If when you put t equal a, what happens? I get f of a, x minus a over x minus a, which is 1. So I get f of a minus f of a, which is 0. And when you put t equal x, this is x minus x, so it's 0, and I just get f of x. But we already observed that f of x is 0. So what do we have now? We have g of a is 0, and g of x is 0. Therefore, and g is differentiable, actually, right? So the Rolle's theorem tells me that g prime vanishes at some c. Yeah, and this is my c, actually. Now, when you compute g prime of t, you get what? You get f prime of t. This is just a constant. And here you get n plus 1, x minus t to the n, but minus minus cancel. So you get f prime of t plus n plus 1, x minus t to the n over so on. And just replace t by c now. And so you get precisely that. So this should be 0. This sum should be 0. Okay, so now f prime of c, you replace f prime of c by its value that I obtained here. And the second one I don't touch. So the sum of these two terms should be 0. Right? Uh, sorry, this is there's a slight error here. It is uh, x minus c, not x minus t. This is a c. So I have a common factor here, x minus c to the n, x minus c to the n. So I can simplify and I get what actually? I get that a value of f of a. So f of a is just actually uh, x minus a n plus 1 times the derivative over n factorial times n plus 1. Because this is this is 0. Okay, so I get f, the value f of a from this formula. And f of a is just the remainder, and that's it. So not trivial. Okay, so there's, this is c, not t. Okay, and the same remark holds here. I can, if I put uh, x minus a equal h, I also get this formula. And if in addition fn plus 1 is bounded, now I need to assume that fn plus 1 is bounded on a neighborhood of a because fn plus 1 is not continuous, not necessarily continuous. So, I, so if in addition fn plus 1 is bounded near a, then I can do the same estimate. This is absolute value of h. So I get the same remark. The, the, the remainder in Taylor Lagrange is the big O of h n plus 1. Okay, provided the n plus 1 derivative is bounded. Okay, which was automatic in Taylor Cauchy, but it's not automatic, so I have to assume it. Okay. So this is what we call an asymptotic relation. Okay, it's an asymptotic approximation of f by a polynomial. It's really something local, actually. Here. Okay, and finally Taylor-Young. Uh, so the assumption are now that f has uh, n minus one derivatives, and the derivative at a. The derivative of fn minus 1 at a exists, just existence. And so we can write f of x is a polynomial plus a, plus a small o of x minus a to the n. Okay, now the approach here is a little bit different. We just apply L'Hopital rule several times, n minus 1 times. Okay, so we must prove that the difference between f and this polynomial divided by x minus a to the n tends to 0. This is just the meaning, okay? Because what I wrote here in the numerator is just Rn, because Rn is just the difference between f and the, its Taylor approximation. Okay? Now, if you put x equal a, you get 0 over 0, right? And, of course, we are in the assumptions of, uh, of, of um, L'Hopital rule, because the denominator vanishes only at a. Okay? So all the assumptions are there. So we just differentiate another time. Now, if you differentiate another time, we get f prime of x minus, now the f prime of a comes from here, not from here, because this is the constant. Okay, so I just differentiate each term. 
Okay, the, the, the derivative of the last term with respect to x is just uh, fn of a, which is a constant now, divided by n minus 1 factorial over x minus a n minus 1. Okay, and I differentiate the denominator, I get this. And I still have something of the form 0 over 0, because when I put x equals 0, I get 0 in the denominator. So I continue this n minus 2 times. So in total, I apply L'Hopital rule a L'Hopital rule n minus 1 times, okay? So what do I get, actually, after n minus 1? At the n minus 1 step, I get the limit of fn minus 1 of x minus fn minus 1 of a. This is the, le so this is the last term, actually. And this is the one before, right? And I still also have something of the form. Now, this is easy. I don't need to use L'Hopital rule any anymore. Just rearrange so split the, the term into two fractions so fn minus 1 at x minus fn minus 1 at a divided by x minus a the n factorial doesn't count and here simplify by x minus a and get just get fn at a okay and now we are almost done this the limit of this guy of this fraction here is just fn at a of at a because this is just because fn at a is the derivative of fn minus 1. Okay, so I get fn of a minus fn of a, and this is 0, and that's it. Okay, I did. I don't need more than existence of fn at a. I don't need continuity or something. Okay, so this is fn of a minus itself, and this is 0, and that's it. So this concludes, and we already observed that, uh, so we can write Taylor's doing in this form, fa plus h equal fa plus etc. And the remainder is now small o of hn and not big O of hn plus 1. Now, of course, a big O of hn plus 1 is a small o, but the converse is not true. Okay? So, this concludes the video and the course, actually. The lectures are, we are now done. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to solve the exercises of uh, chapter 4, and this will conclude the course, and uh, I wish you good luck in your exams. So thank you for your attention, and see you next time.